And um, just a little bit before you get started, um, this is so exciting to sort of share um, all this information with everybody. Um, Dr. Lewis previously was a Mellon postdoctoral fellow at Pennsylvania State University. He received his PhD in philosophy from the University of South Florida while holding a Mellon Fellowship at Emory University in the James Weldon Johnson <laughs> Institute for the study of race and difference. So if I were to say, I never looked. His research interrogates philosophy through a historical <laughs> lens with focuses on the early modern period, Africana philosophy, the philosophical canon, and the discipline of philosophy. Today's talk is based on Professor Lewis's dissertation entitled Anton Wilhelm Amos' Philosophy and Reception from the Origins through the Encyclopedia it is a project he's developed into, into a book. And the wider context of his research, he describes as follows, and I quote, my project contributes to philosophy and the academic community in three ways. One, philosophical inclusion and diversity. Two, black history. And three, the historical ontology of race. It is this intersectional approach to philosophy that I believe allows me to contribute to my field in new and interesting ways. Many people believe that philosophy is dying. I believe diverse individuals like Amo and diverse ideologies offer breath and life to philosophy. This is because, as Michel de Montaigne explains in the essays, we learn from the unfamiliar. Welcome, Professor Lewis. How are you all doing? Thank you so much for that introduction. It was awesome. Um, it actually, uh, yeah, it got me because it actually is true to who I am. It really is. Um, so my name is Dwight. And today I'm going to be giving a particular talk on Anton Wilhelm Amo titled Into the Wake. Um, Anton Wilhelm Amo, if I can start sharing my screen, I will. So I can give you the slides here. I'm sorry, you know, this is always complicated every time you do this. Um, and now I can't find the slide, of course. Um, oh, here we go. Here we go. Take your time. Share. Hopefully you guys can see the slides now. Can you see them? If you can, give me some type of reaction. If you can. We can okay. see them. Looks Wonderful. Good. Okay. So um, today, again, thank you all for being here. Um, you know, uh, I, uh, I am going to be going a little fast. I don't know how long you wanted me to talk. Um, if it's if I have an hour or 45 minutes, but I'll try to stay in that range somewhere. Um, uh, hopefully that works out for us. Um, so I want to, uh, part of the reason why I named this in the wake Anton Wilhelm Amo is because I read a recent book about a year ago um, by Christina, Christina Sharp called In the Wake on Blackness and Being. If you haven't read this, and I would really encourage you to check it out. Um, I think it it, um, it really gives us an analogy that is really helpful in relationship to um, to race today, but also the ways that it was developed throughout history. So what she tells us is that there are, she uses um, this um, metaphor of the ship and she gives us four different um, concepts in relationship to the ship. She says that there's the weather, the ship, the hold, and the wake. The weather being white supremacy, the ship being systematic racism, the hold being the denial of being two Blacks, um, and the wake being Black death. Um, the way that history still defines and kills um, Black bodies, not only uh, today, but as in the past, right? And we can think of people um, like uh, George Floyd or Breonna Taylor over the summer, um, or we can think even recently in the U.S. with people like Wallace um, Walter Jr. Um, for some reason, um, um, a gun in the hand of a black body is more dangerous than an AK in the hands in, um, in white hands. Um, and this is based um, particularly on the objectification of blackness and the connotations that flow from um, from the ways that history has objective has objectified blackness. And so what we're going to look at to some extent is the formation of some of these concepts, right? And we're going to look at them not um, in a way that um, negates or that uh, looks at them uh, outside of the outside of the philosophical canon, 
but we're going to look at the ways that that's actually intertwined in the philosophical canon through Anton Wilhelm Amo's life. Um, if we're going to talk about the ways that I go about doing philosophy, one of the things I really attempt to do um, uh, in my own methodology, in my own methodology, is I attempt not to. Um, uh, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong in this methodology. Um, it was needed for us to create space. But when we talk about uh, philosophy of race, philosophy of race is oftentimes relegated to the edges of philosophy. It's not seen as a center point in philosophy. Um, and when I was, uh, I have a podcast and on the podcast, I had uh, Charles Mill and Linda Alcoff. And one of the things we talked about are the ways that uh, philosophy of race is seen as a stepchild. Um, and so what I'm attempting to do in the ways that I do philosophy is I try to intertwine um, uh, uh, the concepts of race, uh, gender, or anything in relationship to the pr protected classes to the actual core of the canon. What I want to do is actually not have philosophy of race or when we're talking about things that have to do, have to deal with decolon decolonizing um, philosophy to be at the fringes of philosophy. I want that to be at the center. And so then how do we actually go about doing that, right? Um, and I'm gonna skip a few slides and come back because I, I wanna get to how we actually go about doing that. You know, when we look at the early modern time period, we oftentimes um, see this division, rationalist empiricist, and then uh, this the God of early modern, right? Kant coming and bridging this particular gap. Um, and one, and um, what I attempt to do first off in the first phase of what I do um, with the Moes, I attempt to make us focus on his philosophy so then that he can be let into the room um, with these other philosophers, right? Um, but, but at the moment that he's let in the room, um, his blackness becomes apparent, right? And then we, off, we automatically have to then deal with um, the, social, the social features that come along with that blackness, right? Um, and leads us hopefully into phase two, which is when we begin to deal with concepts like human difference, slavery, and race, um, which are things that are oftentimes left out of the early modern conversation. But when we want to talk about that slave ship um, that Christina Sharp, or, uh, Christina Sharp talks about, then we really have to uh, deal with the formation of that slave ship, right? Um, and it exists in the early modern time period, right? Um, but these are things that are oftentimes left out or, or um, are devoided um, in the early modern time period um, in relationship to how come we can read someone um, uh, we can read um, uh, ethical um, ethical works uh, like um, like Hobbes or like Rousseau, um, and then not consider slavery at all. Um, how is it that I could go through an entire PhD and focus on the early modern time period and never have the concept of slavery come up? When if we're going to really talk about the 17th and 18th century, this is um, the height of the slave trade. Right, um, especially if we want to talk about the 18th century, and so how is it that we have these concepts of mind and body? We've got these concepts of morality. We've got these concepts rolling around, but we're not looking at um, those things that are foundational um, to the period in relationship to applying those uh, those particular ethical concepts. Right, um, and so oftentimes when I give a talk, people get it wrong. They think that I've come to give a talk to talk about a most philosophy. Um, and I actually just, like, I care about the philosophy. The philosophy is great. It's awesome. Philosophy is great. Um, but that's never my goal. My goal is for a, for a mo to be let into the room and for us to begin talking about what it means to exist in this room, right, um, um, as this stark black figure. Um, and then what that then gives us um, in relationship to it. Um, and I think you can see how this um, how this applies and what this gives to us, even in relationship to what to the world today. So um, by Mo walking into that room, right, all of a sudden, right, right away, his being is going to be noticed, and that being is going to then force us, right, to ask intriguing and new questions to um, to uh, the philosophical canon. Um, and that's the, for me, that's the real importance of Amo. Um, uh, of course, like his philosophy is great. And I think we're going to get to his philosophy and hopefully we can talk about his philosophy and then talk about the ways that I also think that his philosophy pushes back against the claims that Kant and Hume made, especially in relationship to the inferiority of black minds, right? 
Um, but before we get there, I want to again come back here and talk about why this is all important, right? Um, so um, one of the things when we talk about the importance of this thing, I really think there are many phases. Um, I'm only going to give four here, um, really five, but um, it, it it really goes nonstop. It's really nonstop. Um, so um, when we talk about the importance of inclusion, we really want to begin by talking about, I always start with my students um, because they are the ones that matter to me anyways. Um, the future generations, I tell my students, if, I, if I've, I've really screwed up, if you're, not further, if you're not further along than me at a younger age, right, then I wasn't a good teacher. The goal of being a good teacher is trying to get your students to be further along than you at a younger age, so then the next generation can be further, next generation can be further. Um, and even in relationship to inclusion and diversity. So um, when it comes to my students, um, one of the reasons this is important is because first off, uh, my, uh, the, when I was in grad school, the chair of my department came to me after a year of teaching. Um, and he said, it's, it's wild to me how important diversity is. Um, because what I've noticed even in the past year is that be, once you started teaching, the diversity, the diverse amount of students that were philosoph that were philosophy majors actually increased, just from you being in the classroom, just from having a, di a diverse figure doing the work of standing in the classroom and teaching philosophy, we've seen a change in the amount of students that actually um, are black and choosing to be uh, to to be philosophy majors. Um, and then secondly, um, this is really predicated on the fact that I was in a particular school where when I went to undergrad, um, there were, I was not assigned to any black figures the entire four years. And I didn't go to undergrad a long time ago, you know, 10 years ago, um, I was an undergrad. Uh, and yet there were no diverse figures. And so at the end of my four years, I went to my advisor and I asked him, um, can someone like me even do this? Right, can someone like me even do this? Um, and uh, thankful for Tom Schwanda because he told me yes. Um, but there are many of students that don't have the courage to ask that question and then are not moving forward in academia because they don't have someone telling them that they can do this or that there are diverse figures in front of them that are doing the work that they want to do. Um, I have um, I have students from all, all over the world even now that I meet with that are that are black and brown um, because they don't have someone around them. Uh, that is where I'm at, right? Um, secondly, uh, curriculum. Um, so we need uh, faculty in the departments, um, not just at the departmental level, but also at the college level, right? Um, and the reason I say this is because I was in a curriculum meeting. Um, I don't remember what university I was at, but I was in a curriculum meeting where a lot of my uh, fellow faculty members were saying how, white fellow faculty members were saying how they didn't know how to make um, how to make um, uh, their curriculum diverse. And so they don't, they didn't try. And I stood, I literally raised my hand right away. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. If that's the case, then there's a lot of things that we wouldn't do if everyone was like, hey, cause I don't know how to do it, then I'm not gonna do it. And so I responded in two ways. Number one, you can invite people that do this work to your, to your classroom. There are plenty of people in your area of study that actually work on um, inclusive and in diverse things within your area of study. Why don't you invite them, right? And then number two, I said, it's wild because I work on the fringes of early modern philosophy, but yet I still have to know the core. But yet you get to live in a particular position of privilege where you only focus on the core and you know nothing about the fringes. Is that wrong? Do you think you should know something about the fringes also? What does that tell students about the fringes of philosophy? Right? What does that tell students about trying that are actually working on this diverse work? What does that tell them? That they don't matter. That decolonizing the canon doesn't matter. That if they are race, it doesn't matter. That if they are sex, it doesn't matter, right? And whether you know it or not, unless your student has the courage to step back, to push back against this, then you're oftentimes going to silence them. Thirdly, um, when we come to epistemology, right? I'm sorry, I just can't know what women know. 
There's some things that women know that I just can't know, point blank. I can read about it all I want and I will not know it. And there are some things that being black I know about the world. I'm sorry that my white brothers and sisters are just not gonna know. But when we come to the table and we bring all of this diverse epistemology, whether it's, whether it's female, whether it's black, whether it's brown, whether it's white, and we bring this diverse, these, these diverse amount of standpoints to the table, what we end up with is more epistemology on the table, right? And I thought always that philosophy was about epistemology. But what I'm learning more and more is that philosophy is not about knowledge. It doesn't actually care, right? Because if we cared, then we would actually uh, value these different standpoints because these different standpoints are, are going to allow us to have more epistemology on the table, right? In the same way that um, Montaigne says, you know, uh, you, are, you can only learn from what you don't know. And so it is when we allow this epistemology from different standpoints to be placed on the table that we can actually have more epistemology, which is going to lead us to number four here, which is innovation, right? Everyone's about innovation now. But if we have a more epistemology, more knowledge on the table, then we're actually going to make this, be able to make this movement to having more innovation because there's more information to create with. And lastly, I just put it's, the, it's just the right thing to do. <laughs> and it's crazy that I have to even say that, right? If we look at the um, early black feminists from the, uh, uh, from the late 19th, early 20th century, we see that over and over they bring up morality, 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 morality. I don't even put morality into this list really. because morality doesn't get people to actually care about diverse peoples anymore. I've got to sell people on innovation and epistemology. Not that it's just the right thing to do, the moral thing to do. Sad, it really is sad. We're existing in a world particularly where we're not actually looking at our own position. And we're not actually in a, in a space where we're trying to create justice. And so what I'm trying to do, and I know what, what, um, what, this, um, what this project is attempting to do, is to push us to position ourselves in particular ways, and to position ourselves in particular ways where we can actually be a means of creating justice, right? And I hope um, through all of this, um, through all of this talk that, uh, that we're working on, where I'm gonna be going over a mo, um, I hope that from this, um, what we will see is that there's, there are ways, even now, in philosophy, in even early modern philosophy, right, to position ourselves philosophically in such a way where we can create justice, where we can actually be doing this inclusion work. Now, I'm not going to say that this work is easy. You know, um, I get pushed back all the time. Um, but I will say that it is that it is that it is completely I think it's completely and, and utterly worth it worth it um, and partly and I come again to this worth it because um, it's changing the it's changing the future right um, and when I think about justice justice is something um, that allows the future uh, to be better than the past right allows the future to be better than the past. Um, here I, I was, this is uh, me with my students right here out at lunch um, because I try to give them all that I have. Um, if I can build, if I can build them up um, to believe that they can be more than what the world tells them they can be, um, then I feel like I've won and I feel like I've won. Um, so let's jump into a mo. I know I gave a lot of inclusion stuff uh, prior to this. Um, I don't know how, um, how, um, how um, on the surface you wanted me to be, but I am really attempting um, to um, um, really uh, untangle um, inclusion and its relationship to the early modern canon. And I hope that uh, this will do it for us a little bit. So who is Anton Wilhelm Amo? Who is he, right? Um, Anton, Milha Anton Wilhelm Amo was born in, um, in West Africa 
in Guinea in about 1703. Um, and, and more to be more, more specific, we can look right here in um, Ghana. Um, and then in 1707, he was taken to um, Amsterdam and gifted to um, Anton Ulrich, the Duke of New Brunswick, Wuffenbuttle. Um, um, he was also given then to his son, Augustus Wilhelm. Um, if you look here, you can see where Mo got his name, right? Anton Wilhelm Mo. Imagine waking up every day um, and living with the name of your proprietors. Um, what, a, what a life to live. Um, he was then taken, of course, this became um, a Mo's new home. It would have been Stark, right? We're talking about from where this is even in 1733, which is, you know, 25 years after a Mo, after a Mo left, 30 years after a Mo left, um, after he was born anyways. And what we see here are guns are being used as sticks, right? And this becomes his new home. And a Mo, of course, um, as you guys, some of you already know, was actually able to do some pretty magnificent things uh, with this experience, right? Um, unlike the other, unlike the other Africans in the Duke's um, care, he was able to be educated. Um, now we don't know exactly why. There are a lot of of um, of hypothesis in relationship to this. Some people think that he did this because of Peter the Great. Peter the Great had just taken on a more about a year before. Um, Anton Ulrich had taken on um, um, a Mo uh, named Abraham Gandibald um, and actually made him a part of his family to some extent. Abraham actually, Abram actually went on to be a general in um, the Russian in the Russian army. Um, but um, Peter the Great only had one surviving child to um, to um, to adulthood, which was Alexei. Um, and so part of it is that. Uh, Peter the Great was just attempting to acquire, um, I think, attempting to acquire some type of love. Um, but also, I think that he was attempting to acquire uh, prestige and glory, right? When we want to talk about the early modern time period, we really have to talk about the ways that Blackness was used, right, or objectified, even in the early modern time period. So we're talking about the beginning of, right, we brought up the slave ship of uh, the the metaphor of Christina Sharp's shave, slave ship, right? Um, and we talked about the objectification of blackness, right? And here we see the beginnings of the objectification and use of blackness, right? So we have Peter the, I mean, this is not Peter the Great, this is Louis the Fourteenth's um, sister-in-law over here with her more, or her African. Um, and then we have her, his two daughters here, um, Louis the Fourteenth's two daughters here with their African. Um, and so when we talk about the use of, Afri Af of an African during the early modern time period, what we're really talking about are the ways that it could bring glory and prestige um, to your particular house or to your court, right? Um, and so part of the reasons why we want to say someone like Anton Ulrich or someone like Peter the Great or someone like Louis XIV actually acquire these Moors or these Africans was to look a particular way and to show a particular glory to those people that were also of the same social class, right? And to, and to then delineate themselves in relationship to that class, um, to allow themselves to look even better, to look even better. We don't actually have that much information about a Mo's life um, until we get to 1727 um, and afterwards. So in 1727, he begins his collegiate studies at the University of Halle, um, and he acquires, or at least he defends his um, legal disputation in 1729 um, called On the Rights of Moors or Africans in Europe. Now, we don't have that actual text. I really wish we did. It would be an amazing text to actually get our hands on. Um, it's sad. COVID got in the way of me spending this summer actually looking for this text, um, which would just be an amazing find, an amazing find. Um, um, but um, what we do have is uh, the Hollow Weekly Newsletter gives us a little summary of it. I don't have the entire summary up here, um, and I can put that up first later if someone wants to look at it. Um, but three things that we can take from this summary is um, uh, that Amo was actually given this topic um, from his faculty advisor. And so one of the things that tells me is that the legal scholars at the time actually understood, right, the complications surrounding African slavery and freedom. Like this wasn't something that was just like, oh, uh, wild and out there. Um, but this was actually something that people understood and thought about. Um, 
Secondly, I want to give us a little summary of his argument, right? So what he tells us is that since the Holy Roman Empire is an extension of the Roman Empire, and since Africans were given a royal seal and made a providence um, and given citizenship in the Roman Empire, um, then they should also not be allowed to be enslaved in the Holy Roman Empire because they are still citizens um, uh, of the Holy Roman Empire since they were citizens in the Roman Empire. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, so, um, and I'll, maybe I'll say it one more time, right? So we've got the Holy Roman Empire and the Holy Roman Empire is an extension of the Roman Empire. If Africans were citizens in the Roman Empire, then they should also still be citizens in the Holy Roman Empire because the Holy Roman Empire is an extension of the Roman Empire, right? And if they are citizens, then they cannot be enslaved. Then they cannot be enslaved. Right. Um, I think this is a great legal argument. Um, and what I did, um, and it says here, lastly, we understand that Amon made the argument from the European perspective. It actually tells us in this article that he used European books, right, um, and travel logs. And one of the things I did is I went and um, I uh, looked through the texts of the legal scholars in Hala at the time, the professors, and I tried to see what they were citing in relationship to Africa. Um, and I tried to see what they were citing in relationship to the law. And so the two things that we had that I saw through pervasively throughout all the texts were the Justinian corpus um, and Leo Africanus's uh, complete description of Africa. And if you put those two texts together uh, just by themselves, no other texts, you can make the argument that Amo makes. Um, because we see in the Justinian corpus this exact fact um, that Africans were given a royal patent um, and made a part of the Roman Empire as citizens. And then in Leo Africanus, he actually says, uh, he actually talks about the Africans losing the Roman tongue, um, which is uh, which I thought was really, really, really interesting. Um, um, so um, when we talk about um, the ways uh, that even a Mo at his time was trying to decolonize the academy, <laughs> um, right? Uh, we see it even here, we see it even here. Um, in 1734, he made a move to the University of Wittenberg. Um, now, we don't know why he made this move. Um, um, I do have some, um, some, um, some hypothesis in relationship to it. We can talk about in the Q&A if someone wants to talk about that. Um, but it is here that Amo defends his dissertation in 1734 on the impassivity or the apathy of the human mind which will be the focal point of the rest of the talk when we get to the philosophy section. Um, and what he does in here is he makes a fairly good critique of Rene Descartes' mind-body union. Um, and one of the exciting things that he does is he actually uses Elizabeth also as a springboard for that argument, right? So um, throughout his life, we have three texts that we have printed still now. Um, the one uh, legal disputation we don't have, but the three texts that we do have are the apathy, um, of the meter dissertation, um, which is a dissertation that Amo wrote with a student, uh, also published the same year. And then we have um, um, his legal, I um, mean, his um, logic treatise in 1738. Um, the, the text that I'm working on right now, um, what I'm trying to do is use his uh, methodology that he gives us in 1738 um, in his Tractatus um, to then talk about, uh, to then use that to untangle what he's trying to get at in uh, the, uh, the apathy of the human mind. I won't get into his, the, the uh, methodology in this talk, um, but um, that is what I'm trying to do in relationship to this text. Uh, so, oh, one of the, so I also just wanna give you some intriguing features. Um, this is one um, here, uh, this is from in Mo's actual hand. Um, and what we have here is actually a lecture announcement from 1739, right? Um, uh, where I'm most given a lecture announcement um, where he's at um, Jaina. Um, and one of the things I just want to point out are the types of things that early modernists were studying at this time. Um, so he says that he's going to teach us things like philosophy, uh, physiognomy, palmistry, astronomy, uh, the art of deciphering the superstitions of the common people, uh, which is, uh, I think we read that today and we're like, wow, like that's not philosophical at all. Um, but I think we have to, uh, um, again, put ourselves in the context 
Um, I'm always going to say the context matters. You know, texts do not live in a vacuum, but they live um, constrained within a particular context. Um, and if we look, and if we want to talk about the ways that uh, he's doing, you know, uh, palm reading and astronomy, and talking about how that's philosophy, we have to also talk about the ways that Newton believes um, that he can actually find the the um, the uh, sorcerer's stone, right? He actually thinks that he can, uh, he's an alchemist that actually thinks that he can turn base metals um, into, into uh, high level metals, right? Um, and so this isn't something that's just, that a Mo is just doing, but this is something um, that is for basis of, across the early modern time period. Um, in, 70, in 1746, we actually have this text where a, uh, where a Mo is actually draws, draws this woman um, um, uh, snuffing uh, tobacco. If you look down here at the very bottom, we can see where it says, a Mo the African made this, or you can translate it made by a Mo the African. Um, and the reason I put this up here is because I really want to do what a Mo tells us to do on the other side of this, of this page. So there's two sides to this text. Um, on, the other side, um, on the other side, a Mo says this, with this drawing, and by his own hand on the following page, sketched, sketched out graphically, Anton Wilhelm Amo, African by nationality, master legions in philosophy and liberal arts, and candidate in law, entrust to you to keep him in your memory. Um, and what I am trying to do is actually keep Amo in our memory. Um, and by keeping him in our memory, to force or to push the early modern time period to also um, become broad enough uh, to accept a Mo and to accept the concepts that come along with the Mo, that they're not just going to be concepts about the mind and the body, but they're going to be concepts that push us towards thinking about how the mind and body might play into race, um, how the mind and body might play into gender. Um, what is, what did race, how did race play um, into uh, Descartes in relationship to meditation one, which no one, no one ever talks about the fact that Descartes makes a, um, makes a black bow joke um, in meditation one. Um, and it's like, these are the things where if you have a backing um, in the historical ontology of race, you begin to re read the early modern time period in such a way um, that it forces you um, to ask new and intriguing questions. Um, and, you know, people have been reading the meditations for, you know, 300 years, and yet I still have yet to read a person um, that actually talks about this black bile joke in a way that it is actually racially defined. Um, even though if we want to talk about race in the modern time period, we have to talk about the humors and we have to talk about black bile and the fact that blacks are oftentimes considered as having an excess of that and that that leads to hysterica, hysteris, being hysterical, right? Um, it leads to being a little crazy. Um, and so what did, what, what was, what was Descartes doing there? Um, um, and these are the type of things that having someone like a Mo in the early modern canon is going to push us to ask these type of questions. In 1747, a Mo returns to Africa. Um, we don't know why. I want to say it's because of rising racial tensions, right? This is right around the time where, um, around the 1750s, where, where we see is the height of the slave trade. We also see a height in relationship to people defining um, Negroes, especially West Africans, as being um, less intelligent. Um, and there's no, to me, there's no reason, um, uh, there's no real reason for Mo to return, except if uh, there is something going on like that. Um, he doesn't know the language. Um, he is not particularly tied to the community in real, in ways um, where he's, he's been gone since he was three. Um, there just is, um, there seems to be, and maybe someone will have some ideas after this that they can push me on, um, but it seems to be the, to me the case um, that one of the reasons why he returns, or one of the major reasons is because of the racial tension. Um, so um, he returns to around Fort Sebastian where he lies today, right? This is Fort Sebastian, right? Well, not right now today, but in the last two years. Um, um, and this is a Mo's grave there at uh, Fort St. Sebastian, right here. And here's the front of his grave right there, um, where he lies right now. Um, it's amazing to me that he lies in the wake, right, also, but in the wake of a slave, sh of, a, of, a, of a slave fort, um, in the wake, just steps away, right? This is a slave fort right behind me here. It's his grave. Um, oh. I think someone, did I hear someone? 
Um, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm just saying, if you are, if you can, mute yourself, um, just because sometimes I'm hearing you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, all right, so let's actually get into the philosophy. You know, this is, like I said, this is the part that um, is not as intriguing to me. Um, I understand that this is the part that allows a lot of people to be um, uh, to be sucked into this, um, but it isn't the part that intrigues me. Um, the part that intrigues me is the part that leads us um, away from the norm narrative and pushes us to actually um, uh, push back against the canon um, and leads us to more decolonizing thought. Right. Um, so the apathy of the human mind. Um, when we open up the apathy of the human mind, it's really divided into two sections. We've got chapter one, which is really focused on definitions and chapter two, which is focused on application. Um, so what we're going to do is really focus on chapter two. Um, chapter two gives us um, chapter two begins with uh, uh, the state of controversy, which is how a Mo is actually going to go about critiquing Descartes. So what he does is he starts with, and if you, um, I don't know if you've read the, um, the correspondence between Elizabeth and Descartes, but, um, but uh, Elizabeth um, reads the meditations and writes to Descartes, um, and then Descartes writes back, and then they keep a correspondence going on for years. Um, and so uh, what Amo does, and just so you know, Elizabeth did not allow her, um, her um, correspondence to be published. So uh, Mo is only reading Descartes' side of the correspondence, right? Um, and so what Mo is doing is he's reading these responses, and he reads this, and this is where he begins to be um, to um, to. Um, sorry, I actually have to move this uh, picture to. Um, and this is where he begins to um, push back on Descartes, right? Um, so I've given my translation and then two other translations. For there are two things in the human soul on which all the cognition that we are able to have of its nature depends. One of which is that it thinks and the other united to the body, it is able to act and to suffer with the body. It, the soul can be, can act on and be acted upon by it. It, the soul can be acted, can act and be acted upon along with it. Um, so I don't know if we have any Descartes scholars in here or anyone who really focuses on this type of work. Um, but one of the things you can, you can, I, uh, if you are, hopefully you can already see um, where Mo is going with this. When we want to talk about uh, Descartes' ontological distinction, Descartes makes a distinction between the mind and the body, right? He says the mind is this immaterial substance. It is active. It is indivisible. Um, it is uh, res cogitos. It is only a thinking thing. The body is a material substance that is passive, is res extensia. It is only an extended thing, right? Um, so we have this, these ontological distinct substances, ontological distinct substances. But what we read here is that he tells us, right, and we talked about activity and passivity too. The mind is only active based on its ontology, and the body is only, is only passive based on its ontology. But what we read here is that the mind can act on and be acted upon. Only something that is passive during the early modern period is something that can be acted upon. So what we read is Descartes talks about this ontological distinction, and we understand that this has to be a real distinction from meditation five, right? Um, he gives us two arguments why this needs to be a real distinction. It can't just be a conceptual distinction, right, um, between, my, between the mind and the body. But what we see is that the union of these two things, Descartes tells us that the mind becomes a whole new thing, right? The mind becomes active and passive. So if we take mind being this and body being this, at the union, the mind becomes mind and body. It takes on the ontological, it takes on the, uh, the ontological, uh, ontological distinctions that are in the body also. Amo reads that and he says, Descartes, oh my goodness. This is a contradiction. There can be no communication between contrary opposites. Sensations are only experienced by sensations are only experienced by divisible things, and thought is not divisible. So to say that the mind can be acted upon is completely contrary to your system that you've created based on this ontological distinction between the mind and the body. He then pins these three theses. 
to then, and part of why he's doing this is he's trying to make it where there is a, there is a distinction between, he's trying to hold to Descartes' ontological distinction more than Descartes, the mind and body distinction, right? So what he does is he gives us these three theses. The human mind does not sense material things. The faculty of sensing does not belong to the mind. Sensing and the faculty of sensing belong to the human body, which is living and organic. So what we have here, human mind, we have, um, and I'm gonna do a little bit of early modern philosophy. Um, I'm sorry, um, but I'm gonna do a little bit. So if we got human mind, we've got, uh, we've got subject one, right? Sensing things, uh, sense material things, predicate one, the faculty of sensing, predicate two, does not belong to the mind, predicate um, subject one. And then we got sensing and the faculty of sensing, predicate one, predicate two, belonging to the human body, subject two, right? Um, so what he does is he negates the first predicate, I mean, the first subject to get to the second subject, right? Because the human body, the human being is only made of two things, mind and body. So if he can negate one of those things, that it has to pertain to the other thing, right? So if you can negate the predicates of subject and the fa of sensing and the faculty of sensing from the human mind, then sensing and the faculty of sensing have to pertain to the human body, right? Which is why that is subject to. Um, um, so how does he go about doing this? Um, he does this by explaining these uh, three theses. The first thesis that I'm gonna go through is um, the human mind does not sense material things. Why does the human mind not sense material things? I'm going to put this up here so you can read it. Um, but Descartes makes this ontological distinction that the human mind is a indivisible substance. And what Amo wants to say is that only a divisible substance can actually receive sensible qualities or sense data. Right, an indivisible substance can't actually be pressed upon, right? It can't be impeded upon. Only a divisible substance like a body can actually be pushed upon or impeded upon. A mind is only going to be able to have cognition of a thing. It's only going to be able to create ideas, right? But a body is actually pressed upon and actually experiences sense datum in the same way that your ear is hearing me. Your eyes are seeing me. They're actually being impeded upon to do that work, right? And so what Amo wants to tell us is that a spirit thing like the mind cannot be divided and thus cannot have constitutive parts. And only something with constitutive parts can be pressed upon or can be impeded upon by sensible qualities, right? Therefore, since it cannot be part of the mind because it is not divisible, but based on the body's divisibility, the reception of sensation is a necessary condition of the living and organic body. I hope you get the distinction here. The, the mind is indivisible. The body is divisible. Only something divisible can be impeded upon, like with sensible qualities. The mind is only going to be, in, the mind actually is not impeded upon. It creates um, ideas or images are representations of those things, those things out in the body, but it actually like you don't have a material, you don't have a material um, uh, idea or representation of a cat in your head, right? You don't like actual material. No, it's going to be conceptual, based on an idea, right? Um, and so what Amo wants to say then is that the mind doesn't sense material things. All it does is create representations of things that are in the world. But the body, on the other hand, actually experiences those things that's actually impeded upon. Thesis two, the faculty of sensing does not belong to the human mind. So of course, at the early modern time period, we had this idea um, that you needed to have an ability to do a thing, to be able to do a thing, right? Um, so if I'm going to sense, then I have to have a faculty of sensing that is, allows me to be able to sense, right? Um, and what Amo tells us are these two things. Um, to live and to sense are inseparable predicates. The reason is this conversion. Everything that lives necessarily senses, and everything that senses necessarily lives. So that the presence of the one implies the, necess the necessary presence of the other. To live and to exist are synonymous. Everything that lives exists, but not everything that exists lives. For a spirit and a stone exists, but are less rightly said to live. And we read that and we're like, what are you saying, Amo? At least that's what I did the first time I read it. 
um, probably the fourth, fifth, sixth time I read it. Um, but when we break down what I'm always getting at, what he's doing is making a distinction between those things that are living and those things that are existing. What he says is that living things actually have to be intertwined with the circulation of the blood. Because what he tells us is that the blood equals the principles of life, right? So we, like, life doesn't exist without the circulation of the blood. And that circulation of the blood is based in something that is divisible, right? Um, that it's able to circulate and that there are different aspects that are being affected by the circulation of the blood and that it has this particular movement in space allows it to actually then be divisible. Um, we could actually cut blood up, right? Uh, meaning not, maybe not with a knife so much, but you can roll it around in a bowl and actually separate it, right? Um, and so what he wants to say is that the blood um, is um, that thing uh, that gives life um, and its circulation. Um, and because of that, uh, the, body is a, the body is related to the blood um, and its relation to, to the blood is based in divisibility also. Right. Um, but we have something different in relationship to a stone and the soul. This, a stone exists without understanding and does not gain knowledge through sense impingements. I mean, if you hit on a stone, it doesn't have it doesn't have um, it doesn't like ha it can't see it can't hear. It's not feeling that. Right. A stone isn't actually feeling that. Um, also, a stone doesn't have cognition. Right. It just exists. A stone just has existence. Um, um, but it doesn't have life in the way that a Mo wants to define life, right? Um, and a soul also doesn't have life, right? A soul exists because it does not circulate the blood in the same way that a stone does not circulate the blood. Um, and it does not gain knowledge through sense impingements, meaning, it, remember, it is indivisible. It only creates representations. And it is from those representations that it actually acquires understanding, right? But it's not that the soul is actually circulating blood, right? Um, it's not that the soul actually has blood in it. Now, you might want to talk about the brain, but not the soul. We have to really consider what we're talking about soul here. Um, and soul is something, if we want to talk about soul, think about a ghost, right? A ghost doesn't need to circulate blood. Um, so a stone and a soul exist, but they, do, but they are not living things, unlike a body. A body is a living thing. And being a living thing, um, and because it does gain knowledge from sense, because it can be impeded upon, right? We understand because it is divisible, it can be impeded upon, then it has to actually have the faculty of sensing. It actually has to have the faculty of sensing because it actually is divisible and can be impeded upon. Um, and that's the way that it actually gains knowledge, right? You're... Um, your, um, your eyes gain information from being impeded upon, from having sense data out here in the world. Your ears gain information from actually hearing, being impeded upon. Your, your eardrum actually moves in relationship to it, right? Um, and so because of that, Amo wants to tell us that bodies are living, they sense, and they exist, right? Um, they are living um, because they circulate the blood, right? Um, um, and then they sense because it's, divi it's divisibility and relationship to the circulation of blood and being able to acquire sense datum through uh, sense impingements, meaning that it has to exist, right? Based on the fact that we have eyes, ears, taste, these particular faculties, right? Um, and so what Amo does here is he makes this distinction between existing and living. Existing things um, exist in the world, but they do not actually um, sense because only living things can sense. Living things can sense because they circulate the blood and because they are divisible things, right? Um, I hope that makes sense to you. Um, and then lastly, we have uh, thesis three, uh, sensing and the faculty of sensing belong to the human body, which is living and organic, right? And this is pretty much begging the question. Um, the human being has two distinct parts, the soul and the mind. The soul exists, the soul can, the soul cannot live or sense based on the first two theses. Therefore, living, therefore, the living and organic body must receive sensation in the faculty of sensing. If we've only got the mind and the body, and the soul can't be alive, meaning it can't have the faculty of sensing, and since it is not divisible, then it cannot sense, 
and we've only got the soul or the body, right? And it cannot be the soul, then this thing, then sensing and the faculty of sensing have to belong to the human body. Then they have to belong to the human body. So just to give a quick, uh, my own explanation of this, just so I can read this. Hopefully this will boil everything down for you. Um, um, that there is an impasse between the mind and sensation because sensations, um, because the mind is immaterial, indivisible and living and sensations necessarily need to occur upon something passive and material, the body, which means sensations could only ever be cognized through the body, divisible and living. Therefore, sensing cannot be part of the mind or one might not be able to have an immortal soul. Because, living, because sensing and living would then be synonymous with existing. Amor holds a real ontological, ontological distinction between um, the thinking thing and the extended thing in contrast to Descartes, who creates something new at the union, right? Um, so why does this matter? Why does it matter? So again, um, what, what, and I'm just gonna boil this down for us really fast and I will be quick, Hope I will be quick. Um, so we've got mind and we've got body. Um, and Descartes gives us an ontological distinction between these two things. But when he brings them together, the mind is able to take to act in certain ways like a body. Amo says this is not right and, and wants to pull those apart and say, no, the mind can only be ontologically a mind and the body can only hold um, body characteristics, right? Um, and he uses sensation as that thing to create this division, sensation in the faculty of sensing to create this division. And he says, no, the mind is not divisible and it is not alive and therefore it cannot sense material things. The body is divisible and is alive and therefore it can sense material things, right? Now the question is, why does this matter? Um, well, you, I read at the end of this, at the end of the last slide, that part of the reason it matters is because Descartes in the Meditations tells us that the two things that he's going to attempt to prove um, are the, uh, and he does this based on Pope Leo X, are the immortality of the soul and the existence of God. But what Amo wants to say is that if we take Amo's soul uh, to be what it is here, if it can sense, if, if it actually can sense, right, then it can die and it is not immortal because indivisible things can actually be broken down. A living thing like the body has to die. Divisible things have to be able to be broken down and actually broken into parts and can then perish. And so if we take a most impassivity to be the case, right, um, then what we have is that the mind cannot be breaking, broken down into parts and then cannot die. And so then we have here is a Mo actually correcting Descartes' overarching problem um, of actually responding to Pope Leo X. Um, and then I wanna talk a little bit about why he might do this racially, right? So if we took a look at the historical ontology of race, especially at this time period, a Mo is kind of living in between, um, um, uh, in between particular concepts of race. We have race as non-essential difference and race as essential difference, right? Um, and when we, when we look at this, what are we talking about essential and non-essential difference? When we talk about non-essential difference, we're talking about race as it applies to physical difference, bodily difference, nation difference, history difference, biblical racism. But we're not talking about essential racism, which is going to deal with um, inherent intellectual um, difference meaning uh, being mentally inferior, right? So we have these two things, body difference and we have mental difference. Um, Non-essential is body, essential is mind difference, right? Um, so if we take um, Descartes' position and if I have a, in relationship to non-essential difference and if I have a body that is black and it actually comes in, in contact with the soul and you've defined black bodies as inferior, and it comes in contact with a soul that can actually uh, be affected and changed based on that body, then I can take characteristics that I've tied to the black body and I can tie it to the black mind also. And I can lead to essential racism and scientific racism, right? 
And I could do that actually from the body to the mind and then to scientific racism that says that the mind is actually inferior based on blackness. Do you under, hopefully you understand that. So if I, if I take Descartes' position and I say that the black body, uh, this is a black body, this is any type, any mind, but as soon as that black body comes in contact with that mind, it is then going to take on characteristics of that body, right? And if it takes on characteristics of that body and I claim that that body is lesser, right? Then I can go, I can go forth and claim that that mind is lesser also. And then I can go forward and claim like scientific racism is, does that the black mind based on science is a lesser thing. But if I take a Mo's position and I hold that there is a distinction between the mind and body, even when they come together, right? What that means is that the black body, you can define the black body any way that you want to define the black body. But the black body can't actually affect the soul that, was, that is within that black body in the sense that it's actually like physically affecting it, right? And so what it allows is that soul is not then um, defined as lesser than based on actual co uh, um, causation, right? So what ends up happening then is that if bodily sensations do not affect the mind, there can be no essential modifications in the mind. And that mind can then not be considered as lesser than. It is only the body that then can be considered as lesser than. But cognitive ability does not change. Cognitive ability does not change, right? Um, no essential difference equals no difference. Of course, we're going to have these different bodies, however you want to rank them. But what Amo is trying to do is say, you can define me as black and lesser all you want, but you can't define my mind or my cognitive ability as lesser, right? Um, and I, I, don't, maybe, I don't know what's revolutionary, but um, um, these type of ways, working within a system and being able to create a particular theory that allows you to push back already, like he's really pushing back on what becomes the history, the ontological history of race, right? Um, even prior to it happening, even prior to it happening, he's already allowing us to exist in a particular world where um, 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 we can't then, based on causation, based on the black body, define the black mind as lesser. Like we'd have to go somewhere else to define the black body, the black mind as lesser. Um, and this is prior to, we know that Hume says what he says um, in um, 1754, um, where he tells us, and he even puts it in, um, in, the, um, in the index, he puts, uh, he puts Negro, um, an inferior race, right? Um, and he just tells us that the black mind is worse uh, than the white mind. Uh, Kant tells us that we're, that we're stupid just based on the color of our skin, right? Um, and so we see Amo actually pushing back on these concepts, you know, um, at the onset of the development of uh, especially um, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, historical ontology of race. Um, so what are some of the things that, uh, that, uh, that Amo actually gives us? How does he contribute? Number one, he fixes Descartes' problem of the immortality of the soul. Um, he calls, he uh, calls attention to the importance of sensations. Um, he also um, potentially um, addresses some social problems in relationship to the soul being lesser or intellectual ability being lesser. And then he reveals the problem of Descartes' non-distinct substances in, uh, the, in, um, in, uh, in his dualism, um, which, right, it's, it's, uh, to me, it's a beautiful thing um, because we, we define Descartes as this uh, amazing dualist, um, but yet we had this, you know, random African, um, you know, uh, 60 years after Descartes uh, putting that entire system into question in the same way that Princess Elizabeth did it. Um, it's funny to me that the two people I think that actually critique uh, Descartes the most 
are going to be Princess Elizabeth, a woman, and a Mo, a black, a black, a black male. Um, I think it's it's a it's a beautiful thing, and this is why I come back to the epistemology, right? Where your standpoint allows you um, uh, to know things that other people might may not know, or to ask questions in relationship to the things that you're experiencing in the world, or the things that you're reading that other people just may not be asking, right? And so here, I think that comes to that comes um, to bear in relationship to the questions that Elizabeth asks and the questions that Amo asks. Um, I think that this is where we see them asking those questions that are very different from the rest of the early modernists. And I think other early modernists are asking the same questions, but they're trying to fix the problem. And Amo and Elizabeth are like, Descartes, you can't fix this problem. Like, you just don't have distinct substances. Like. The game's just completely over. Um, and right, Descartes then creates a problem that we're still dealing with today. I'm trying to figure out how the mind um, and the uh, body interact, which is just crazy to think about the distinction between those two things. Um, so uh, I am going to end there, I, but I want to end by placing this question in front of you. How are you positioning yourself in relationship to uh, the history of philosophy or in relationship to history in general? How are you positioning yourself in relationship to the academy? Um, how should you be positioning yourself as a means of justice creation, of create, creating, right? Um, how are you going about actually doing the work um, that Amo was doing even during his time, 300 years before you, at a time where his life was literally like on a razor's edge, right? Um, what are you doing in a world that actually allows you to exist in this space? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I hope that you're at least pushing. I hope you're at least just at least pushing. Um, I want to thank you. And I am more than excited for your questions. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you so much for coming and listening.